Uh, so folks, please welcome Sean O'Connor, who is going to talk to us talk to us about from developer to manager. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Uh, before I get into things, uh, I got a few little things to get out of the way. Uh, first up is, when I can make my thing work, there we go. Uh, just a bit of a motion warning. Uh, I've been told that some people get some issues when there's things going on. We're not going into like some kind of horrible uh, Prezo dystopian nightmare, uh, but uh, there will be some anime GIFs and some builds. So if that's a problem for you, I uh, just want to give you a heads up so you have some time to do what you got to do. Uh, next thing to come up, so uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Sean O'Connor, um, the Director of Application Engineering at Bitly. Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, and uh, when Bitly people talk, they tend to get a bit of an interesting reaction, and we can demonstrate here. Uh, so real quick, who here has heard of Bitly? Awesome, pretty much in the entire room. Who here has used Bitly? Similar number. Who here has any idea how we have a business that can support 90 people's salaries? Wow, more than I expected, but much fewer hands. <laughs> Thankfully, Sarah, my coworker, did raise her hand. Uh, the short answer is uh, we build tools to help marketers uh, see into uh, their activity across the internet, right? And we do, th do so through links, right? Because links are everywhere, so when you can see into the link, you can see everywhere. Uh, that's cool. Normally, uh, if I was giving a technical talk, I'd be talking about you know, the billions of clicks that we see every month and the challenges of dealing with that. Uh, but in this talk, this is much more relevant. Uh, so this was us, uh, or a portion of our company, going on an outing about a year ago. Uh, for context, Bitly is about 90 people right now. Uh, of that, about 20 is engineering. We're uh, basically profitable, depending on the month, uh, and growing. Uh, and so that's kind of some of the context for, you know, when you get to that size, that's when, uh, you know, you maybe need some help coordinating things and just having everybody talk to each other and work it out maybe stops going so great. Uh, so let's get into uh, the actual path from uh, journey from in, uh, engineer to manager, right? So when I started Bitly about three and a half years ago, uh, I was just coding, right? Just. Uh, you know, it's full-time, 40 hours a week. Uh, building systems. Uh, it was great, you know, enjoyed, I, I like coding, you know, you just type away. Uh, some days it gets a bit more complicated, but you know, it's still good, and not, you know, if we're all honest, sometimes a firefight can be a little fun. Um, from there, I kind of started to grow into, you know, at the time at point I joined Bitly, I was far enough along in my career where, you know, I had a bit more experience than some of my team members. Uh, so I started doing some mentorship, started uh, working with some people on the data science team, trying to, uh, help them work towards building more production systems uh, and stuff like that. Um, that was cool. And then about a year in, uh, there was a bit of a management shuffle. Uh, and as will happen in that kind of thing, uh, all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, uh, everybody who uh, was my boss or higher uh, had left the company uh, and some new people came in. So it presented an opportunity and a choice. Uh, you know, I was Probably, I was one of the more senior people on my team, probably the person most uh, interested in taking on a leadership role. Uh, so I was given the choice uh, if I wanted to become a manager. And that kind of gets us to our first lesson of the day of becoming a manager is a choice, right? And if you're, so first of all, if you're in a position where it's not a choice, giant red flags run away. <laughs> um, and <laughs> It sounds like somebody somebody might have uh, had that experience. Um, cool. So uh, it should be a choice, given your situation. Uh, and given that you have that choice, it's one that you really need to think about, because there's going to be a lot of things that are different if you make that choice. right? For start off, uh, you're going to be dealing with fuzzy humans instead of uh, computers. right? As frustrating as computers can be, they're at least deterministic, at least when they're working properly. Uh, humans, much less so, at least at a level of abstraction that we work at. Um, additionally, you have to be much more deliberate in your actions and in your speech, right? By the nature of being a leader, uh, everything that you do gets amplified, right? If you're having a bad day, that has a bigger impact. If you say something stupid, more people are going to notice and care, right? Uh, so you have to be deliberate about what you're doing. You're going to be doing less coding, right? Uh, we'll get into this a bit more later, but uh, this is my, uh, if you use GitHub, you either have the you know, contribution graph. Uh, this is my contribution graph for the last year. Zoom in, there's entire weeks where I have done no coding, right? And that's actually a good thing. Right? That's a sign I am doing my job. 
Um, and at the end of the day, it comes down to you're, you're making a career change, right? You were fundamentally doing a different job than you were doing uh, before when you were just an engineer. And there's a few things that come with that. Uh, you have to develop different skills, right? The skills that are critical for you to do your job well are fundamentally different, right? You have to worry about understand people and relationships and communication as opposed to, uh, you know, data structures and uh, computer mechanics and networks. Um, what's important will change, right? Like what your priorities in the given day are, what uh, is the thing that you have to do before you go home in a day will change. Your goals will change, right? How both what you're looking to accomplish and what you will be measured by is going to be different, right? It's not you ship this system or you've built this feature, it's your team shipped this system, your team is happy, your team isn't trying to quit, <laughs> right? Uh, another aspect of this that uh, can be a bit uh, jarring when you actually go through it is your next job hunt is going to look really different, right? You think about how often a company is hiring an uh, engineer versus an engineering manager, right? That's going to be a very different uh, frequency. Uh, the interview process is going to be different, right? Like uh, there isn't something as easy as a coding test for determining managerial skill, uh, at least not that is not horrible and dystopic, like some kind of personality test. Um, and similarly, you, have, you evaluating a potential employer is gonna be a lot bigger deal, uh, just because managers tend to get stuck between a rock and a hard place in, at places. But, uh, so that's all a lot to think about. And you know, uh, you might have some gut reactions to it, but intrinsically, none of that's good or bad, it just is. So how do we think about making that uh, choice, making that decision? Um, and for me, both uh, in the experience that I had and the advice that I got from a lot of people that I really respected, a lot of it basically comes down to what is it that makes you happy, right? What is it about your job that you love that gets you to come back every day and what is going to get you more of that, right? If the thing that makes you really happy every day is sitting down, coding and building stuff and shipping stuff, maybe becoming a manager is not the best thing for you. Uh, I know for me personally, uh, the the getting a tool to, putting a tool in front of somebody and having that make their job easier is what makes me really excited. So management becomes a means to that end, like coding is a means to that end. Uh, but different people have different things that motivate them. So you really need to figure out what it is about your job that you care about and makes you excited and do the thing that gets you more of that, right? So to reinforce, becoming a manager of choice. Uh, and you know, at this point, you know, you could say, hey, managing it's not for me, and then we could be done with the talk, but that would be boring and ineffective. Uh, so let's assume that we're gonna say, yeah, great, let's become a manager, now what? How do we actually go about changing gears from, uh, you know, doing this every day to uh, looking at a people, group of people who are maybe a bit scared and worried about the future and maybe a little confused and making them really excited and happy to come to work every day, right? How do you help a group of people that maybe are not super coordinated uh, instead be uh, a bunch of badasses uh, who can get shit done, right? Um, and you think about the logistics of this and it can be kind of terrifying, it can be kind of daunting, right? Like people are hard to deal with and, the, and they're confusing uh, and just like, you know, coming in cold, like uh, I, know how, I know how to make a computer do things but I don't know how to make or encourage people to do things or get them to do well. Uh, and the thing that kind of got me past that point uh, is realizing and, and you know, getting the advice that management is a learnable skill, right? So uh, at least personally, I come from a liberal arts background, so presumably the thing that I learned is how to learn. Uh, I'm fairly comfortable with the general process of learning things, especially when there's a well-established body of information available about it. And management definitely is a learnable skill. It's not something that, you know, you certainly can have intrinsic traits that make you better suited for it, just like coding or athleticism or so on, um, but it's still a fundamentally learnable skill. And so if you think about it in that way, uh, just like any other learnable skill, there's ways you can go about uh, doing that learning, right? So one of the first ways is through experience. And you might be saying, well, hold on, the basic premise of this is I'm a first time manager. I, by definition, don't have experience managing people. Uh, and that could be true, but uh, you don't necessarily have to be, have had direct experience uh, as a manager to have ma experience with management. In particular, presumably at the point in your career where you're making a choice like this, you've had a boss or two before, right? You've had a manager, you've, in fact, you've probably had a spectrum of managers ranging from, uh, wow, working with that person was miserable, I never want to do that again, to that was an amazing mentor that meant a lot in my life, right? 
Uh, accordingly, you can look back at that experience, and even though it wasn't yourself doing the management, you can think about you know, what, what did they do well, what did they do poorly, how did they handle different situations, what about that can I, I use and learn from, what about that maybe doesn't apply to me and my style. Um, but it's, that's already a big base of experience that you can start building from. Another thing is, uh, it turns out, uh, there's a lot of existing knowledge about management. We've probably been doing something resembling management for the last 10,000 years. Yeah, you know. Um, and over that course of time, a lot of people have figured out things about managing other people and wrote it down. Accordingly, you can now go read it and learn from it. A uh, particular body of work that I uh, find useful for kind of overlapping uh, management and uh, particularly management of engineers is uh, from a guy, Michael Lopp. Uh, I'll get a bit more into some resources later. Uh, also known as Rands. I think he's the VP of engineering at Pinterest these days. Uh, but he has a great blog. That first link is like a list of like blog posts that you should read. Uh, and he has a few books that are uh, good. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and just like uh, any other skill, another way you can help learn, help you know, learning get better is find mentors and find support, right? So ideally, uh, when you're stepping up to become a manager, you have a manager who is more experienced that you can uh, go to and get advice and get feedback from. Uh, hopefully, you have peers within your organization that you can go to and get advice from. If not, there's, uh, hope there's certainly people in your community uh, that have gone through a similar experience and can give you advice. And just like coding, right? Like, uh, I'm pretty sure pretty much anybody in this room, if somebody who's just starting with Python said, hey, I need some help, some advice on like this particular thing that I'm trying to get into with Python, could you help me out, right? You'd all be really happy to do that. Other people who are managers are often very happy to, to provide guidance and support when they can. So reach out and find and build up that network of mentorship and support. So management's a learnable skill. Uh, that makes a lot of things easier. <laughs> Um, so you know we're doing okay. Uh, we're we're you know we're, we're doing all right. We're, we 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 got things under control. At least we feel like we do. Um, and so maybe let's say we have a bit of ambition, and we say we want to go beyond just doing okay and be really good, right? And we really want to make sure uh, the people on your team have the best support that they can, and that they're going to do the best that they can do. So you need to start thinking about so like what's the next level thing? How do I uh, step things up and go beyond just like being competent and doing really well. And to do that, you really need to think about um, what, what is the core thing you're trying to accomplish and build as a manager, right? And from my perspective, management is about relationships, right? And that's our next lesson, right? Um, and, uh, you know, so you can think about what you do, what one does as a manager, right? There's all kinds of like coordination and communication and whatnot, but at the end of the day, uh, if the relationships of your team are not good, uh, then nothing else is going to work right, right? It's the, the foundation for everything else, and that's both uh, that's you know both the, the relationship between you and your reports, the relationship between the members of your team, and the relationships between all those people and other people in your organization, maybe even outside your organization, right? Uh, so if we take that premise, what can we do to uh, improve relationships, build relationships, right? Start off, you have to have trust, right? Uh, just like any relationship in life, if there isn't trust, it's going to be really hard to do anything else in a relationship, right? Um, so we think about how we go about building trust. There's a few things that we can kind of focus on and, and work on uh, at a more kind of like tactical level, right? So uh, one of the most basic things is communication, right? If you can't communicate with somebody, it's going to be really hard to build trust with them. Um, a particular tool for that uh, that I'm a big believer in is one-on-ones. Uh, so I have on the calendar with all my direct reports a uh, half hour weekly meeting uh, where it's just me and the report and we just talk, right? Sometimes we'll come in with an agenda, sometimes we'll just talk about what's going on in life. Um, but it provides a great open channel to uh, make sure that you're staying in touch with people and just to have a very low friction place for uh, to ask questions where like, you know, maybe uh, they overheard something from somebody say something and it would be really kind of awkward to ask in like our open plan office space, right? Um, but if we're in a conference room just one-on-one -on -one in a very casual environment, right, they might say like, oh, hey, I heard about so-and-so doing something. What's that about? That sounds weird, right? Um, but it then also provides a regular checkpoint to like, you know, talk about, you know, how's things going? How are you feeling? Um, here's feedback. Here's, let's talk about like where you want to be heading. You know, it provides just that regular place to, to do that. Um, obviously, there's lots more you can do on communication. 
Uh, something else that's critical both in general for relationships and particularly for communication is empathy, right? You have to, if you can't empathize with your reports or generally the person you're trying to communicate with, it's gonna be really hard, right? Like if, if you can't figure out some way to have at least some amount of understanding of what somebody's going through in the moment, a lot of what they're saying, what they'll say to you will just sound crazy or just nonsensical, right? Because you just don't have the right perspective to understand where they're coming from. Um, so you need to kind of try and figure out how to uh, empathize with uh, your people and where, where they're coming from. Um, and a lot of that you know, can come from like listening, learning about the experiences of other people, learning more about people's backgrounds, right? A lot of that all helps you get to that place. And from there, you need to figure out how to, you need to develop plans, right? Because uh, while communication helps with building relationships, um, it's not enough by itself, right? Relationships require both communication and they require action. If I just talk to you all the time, but we never do anything about the things we talk about, you know, we'll probably be all right, but like that's not terribly satisfying for anybody. Um, and it's not gonna get a whole lot done. Uh, so you need to try and think about, you know, if, if you know that um, somebody on your team is bored with their current project, you need to be on the lookout to figure out uh, how to get them more, either get them on a new project or get them, you know, and, and that's all stuff that takes time, right? It's not stuff that you can just go out and like, boom, it's done, right? Like, so you have to take the feedback that you're getting, take a look at the, see, see the lay of the land and come up with a plan to make sure you're heading in the right direction, right? So all that comes down to management is about relationships. So let's say, you know, we're, we're down with that. Things are going along, things are going okay. And then let's say we have a week where, you know, half your team is out on vacation and conferences and sick and uh, you get hit with a DDoS attack and, uh, you know, servers are lighting on fire and uh, you start doing a bit too much uh, the coding again or whatever it is that, you know, you were doing before you were a manager. Uh, and that can be okay in obviously like emergency situations, right? Like obviously you, you shouldn't be like, well, no, I'm a manager now, I can't touch a computer, right? Like that's obviously absurd. Um, but it's a very slippery slope that you need to be careful about because I know, uh, you know, and this is certainly something I've failed at uh, plenty of times. But I've noticed pretty much every time where, you know, let's say I spend a week uh, focused on coding just to get something shipped and because like it's really time sensitive or whatever, right? It feels good in the moment because like it feels good to be shipping code again and having like a concrete thing at the end uh, to say like, hey, look, this is what I did with my time as opposed to just seeing like a calendar full of stuff. Um, but at the end of it, you end up with like this hangover, right? Like the next week you come in and you realize like, oh, uh, half my team is sitting around twiddling their thumbs because I didn't do the stuff to make sure that they have what they need to do their job well this week, right? So by definition, pretty much any time you're spending coding as a manager or when you're like full time on that side, um, you're not doing your actual job and that becomes a problem, right? Uh, and this basically comes down to management is not doing the work. Right? Management is about enabling your team to, to do the work, but not doing the work yourself, right? Uh, if it's just about doing the work, then like, we wouldn't need managers, right? <laughs> and maybe you don't, depending on where you are. Uh, so another thing that tends to come up uh, that can make things a bit complicated, I touched on it a little bit earlier, is um, you have to be, you, when you're a manager, you end up having to uh, be mindful of how you present yourself and what you're projecting uh, on a given day, right? So it, uh, step back a little bit. Uh, I am generally a really terrible actor. Uh, there's lots of reasons for that, uh, but one of them basically comes down to I'm personally really not good at um, displaying an emotional state that is different than what I'm currently feeling, right? And like that seems like a decent thing for human beings to maybe do. Uh, but if you think about it, you know, as somebody who's a leader of a team, if, you know, let's say I had a rough day at home and like, you know, the dog's sick or get in a fight with somebody or something like that, and I come in and I'm gruff and I'm uh, curt and I'm snapping at people, right? Like that's not gonna set anybody up to have a great day at work, right? At best, somebody will just go like, huh, what's that about? Like that doesn't seem awesome. But at worst, right, they'll feed off of it and it, it's not good for anybody. Accordingly, when you're in that leadership role, you need to be mindful of how you're presenting and try, and at least try to, to you know, uh, not you know, say walk around with a giant creepy fake smile all the time, but um, be mindful of how you're presenting yourself and and what what your what emotional load you're putting on your team uh, that maybe isn't 
necessary for them to deal with. Uh, so my answer is about setting the tone. Uh, similarly, like another aspect of that is, you know, if you come in and you're, it's not to say like, you, you know, you're a puppet master controlling people, right? But like humans are social creatures and they feed off of each other, right? So if you come in and you're really super excited about like what you're taking on that week, right? The, your team's gonna feed off of that. Similarly, if you come in and like, oh, Monday, this is awful, right? Like, that's not gonna have your team to be really excited about what they're doing, right? <laughs> and again, this is something that I personally fail at all the time, but you know, it's, it's something I've learned you, you gotta deal with. So let's say we start dealing with that, uh, and things are going okay again. And uh, uh, so, uh, s s you know, a little detail of, personally, when I transitioned from being a full-time engineer to a full-time manager, one of the things that I l was lucky for me is I had a really easy team when I made that transition, right? Like, there wasn't any internal conflicts in the team. Everybody was excited about their work. Everybody was really engaged. Um, and it was really easy, right? There was obviously still work to do, and there were still challenges, but it was really easy. Uh, in that regard. But, you know, eventually, uh, humans be humans, and things maybe get a bit more complicated, and uh, you need to learn how to deal with that. Uh, in particular, the thing I've uh, learned, and most of the challenges that I've personally faced, basically start off where you notice somebody on your team is, you know, maybe not, you know, somebody who's normally really engaged, and. Um, you know, sociable is maybe become more detached, maybe is usually in a, maybe not in a great mood, their productivity is dropping, right? Like that, when you start noticing that, uh, A, if you're in a place where you're not noticing that, that's a problem. <laughs> but assuming you're doing everything else, like you'll notice when this kind of thing happens. And at first you'll be like, well, I don't know, right? Like there's no debugger for humans. I can't just say like print error and see what's up, right? Um, so, like, at first, like, I don't know, right? And if you're a fairly non-confrontational person like myself, your, your, gut, your initial gut reaction is like, well, maybe if I just, like, ignore it and let them work their stuff out, like, let them, let them just, you know, work through whatever they're doing, uh, it'll just get better on its own. Maybe that'll happen. But most of the time, uh, I, the lesson I've learned is issues cannot be left unresolved. And let's... Let's get into some of the things, right? So, so we, we could start off with the bad plan of uh, just leave it alone and ignore it and see how that works out. Um, but if we, if we explore kind of what, how that could play out in different scenarios, you, we can see kind of how, that, how that's not great. Um, so let's think of one situation where, let's say the reason that somebody is, there's been this change in somebody on your team is that something about their work environment has um, become unpleasant or toxic, right? Let's say they are experiencing some kind of abuse or harassment from somebody in the workplace that you're, you're not directly aware of. Let's say um, there's something that somebody else on the team is doing that is not intentionally, that is not malicious, but is still causing problems for that person on your team, right? Uh, if, that go, if that goes unaddressed for too long, uh, at worst, you're leaving somebody in your team in a really awful position where they're not gonna be productive and they're not gonna be happy. Uh, and then beyond that, right, like you could potentially be leaving somebody generally as another human being in a really terrible place and you could be opening yourself and your company up to legal issues, right? So all that, none of that's exciting or good. Uh, so bad plan there. Um, another possibility is they could be going through something outside of work, right? And this is obviously a, a tricky um, thing to deal with, right? You obviously don't wanna go prying into people's private affairs, but you know, let's say um, they have a sick family member, um, maybe they're going through a bout of depression, um, but if they have something going outside of work and you just kinda ignore the side effects of that, um, A, they may not realize how much it's impacting uh, themselves or their work, but beyond that, they may not, realize that a lot of times when somebody's in that situation, they may feel uh, trapped, right? Like they may not know what options and support are available, right? Like you, if you don't have the conversation of, um, hey, if you know, you, it seems like you're going through something, if you need to take some time, that's okay, you know, or like, you know, if you, if you need help, we can, we can find resources, right? If you don't have that conversation, somebody can feel really trapped because they'll know that they're not doing what they should be doing, like they, they know they're not living up to their expectations, but they also feel like they're helpless to do something about it. So again, ignoring that's not gonna go great. Uh, and the last one is gonna be, or another scenario could be, let's say they're just genuinely dissatisfied with their current role, right? Let's say 
uh, they feel like they're bored with the work they're doing, let's say that they're just not interested in the company's direction anymore, uh, they might not be happy, just they might not feel like they're learning enough, right? And again, ignoring that obviously is not gonna get better on its own, right? That's just gonna uh, spin out of control, right? So at the end of the day, when you notice something, you have to talk to the person about it, right? And it can feel really uncomfortable to start that conversation, right? Like, you know, when, let's, let's say you have your one-on-one -on -one with the person who's come disengaged, and like, you, you, you kind of have to confront, bring it up, right? And it's, uh, I don't know if you, any of you have ever tried to do sales, but at least for me, like, it has a kind of similar feeling to, like, asking for the sale, right? There's this weird thing where you're doing sales where, um, yeah, at some point, like you can you can pitch somebody on your idea, but at some point you have to ask them, like, okay, do you want to buy it? And like that's actually really there's a weird friction to that. Uh, similarly, here asking somebody like, hey, what's up? Like you're not doing awesome. You know, can we talk about? You know, like that's you, you can see right now I'm already uncomfortable about it. I'm just <laughs> pretending to do it, right? Um, but if you don't do it, like it's not gonna get better on its own. You really have to, you have to have the conversation with somebody and maybe you don't walk out of the room with a resolution, right? Like maybe it's just all you, all you accomplish in that first conversation is say like, hey, I've noticed something's up. I'm here if you need me, that's it, right? That's a great start and then you can build from there. But you, you have to start somewhere and you can't leave it unaddressed, both for the, for the, the person who's going through what, whatever they're going through and for the rest of the team, right? Because anybody, anytime you have one person who's who's going to be in a bad place, that can become toxic for your entire team, right? So uh, you can't leave things unresolved. Um, so I know I've been rambling for a little bit. We're getting into the home stretch. Uh, something that kind of is tangentially related to this uh, is the fact that, and kind of re also related to the empathy uh, <laughs> uh, thing I was mentioning before, is uh, by definition, as a manager, everybody's problems are your problems to a degree, right? You have to, at minimum, be able to understand the problems that somebody's going through, if not be able to address it, right? Accordingly, there's two major dimensions where this can be a challenge and where you usually have to do some work and you have to be ready for it before it becomes an issue. One of those dimensions is, is inclusivity, right? Um, so me being you know, a white dude who grew up in a fairly affluent suburb, in the United States, uh, you know, I have my shit to deal with, but like, there's entire categories of problems and challenges people have to go through on a daily basis that I wasn't even aware was a of, of a thing was a thing that people had to deal with until I was m much older in life, right? Um, so similarly, if you don't in teacher, if you don't go out of your way to learn about what experiences other people may have gone through in their life or are actively going through in their life. Uh, again, it's going to be hard to have that empathy to understand what's going on with them, right? Um, some specific resources I would recommend for kind of learning about uh, different things kind of along this area. Uh, one of them is uh, the Geek Feminism Wiki. So obviously this is uh, focused towards a particular dimension of uh, way in which people can have challenges of, of uh, gender, but they have lots of kind of good good resources about that specifically, and more broadly, uh, you might know much. I keep on saying this word dimensionality. If you don't want, I don't know what I mean by that. Go read. <laughs> there are lots of people who have much better uh, explanations than I do. Uh, something else that I would strongly recommend uh, is uh, there's actually a conference happening uh, in this wonderful city in two or three weeks called Open Source Bridge. It's a technical conference, uh, but it has a fantastic people track that has a lot of really good material touching on. Um, the experiences that people go through and how to um, better support people who maybe go through different experiences than you do. Um, I would, if, you can, if you can attend, I would strongly recommend it. Otherwise, check out the videos from the last few years. Uh, they're all online and they're really fantastic. Um, another great resource is uh, Fun Club. So this is a thing run by uh, Ash Dryden and Shanley Kane um, that basically uh, helps fund programs that do uh, different forms of uh, inclusivity work, uh, aside from actually directly funding it, which you know you should probably do because if you're here, there's good odds that you might be have some resources to throw at it. But also by learning about these other organizations, you learn about things that are going on. So learn about and be inclusive. Uh, and the last major chunk here is, uh, as a manager, you're going to be on the front line of mental health, uh, or at least one of. Uh, there's a pretty big stigma still around mental health that's really weird and messed up. Um, I'm going to steal a line from uh, this guy, Ed Finkler, who does some great speaking on the subject. 
you know, if somebody uh, lost their glasses and has vision problems, you wouldn't just tell them to squint harder, right? Like that's, that's kind of crazy, right? But telling somebody who, who's actually going through clinical depression to like, well, just smile and cheer up, like that's equivalently crazy, like even on a physiological level, right? Um, so uh, learning about what mental health issues uh, ha people can go through and how to at least um, guide people to the right support is a really important thing to do as a manager. Um, one great resource is uh, open sourcing mental illness. Uh, this is kind of run by Ed Finkler. There's a lot of great talks and resources on how to learn more about uh, mental health and uh, specifically is a lot of good resources about uh, challenges for our mental health in the tech industry. Um, there's actually a, uh, I don't know the specific research off the top of my head, but there's, there's a substantially higher occurrence of mental health issues in the tech industry than in many other industries. So it's something we have to be acutely aware of. Um, prompt, mhprompt.org is another uh, great resource. And uh, something that I'd recommend that you consider going through if you're gonna become uh, a manager is something called mental health first aid training. Um, the basic idea, so there's a program started in Australia, I think at the late, 2000s, um, but it's spread pretty much worldwide at this point. Uh, and the basic idea is, so medical first aid, the idea is that you should, you, you'd go through relatively brief training that you know doesn't make you a doctor, but gives you enough information to stabilize somebody in the moment and then get them the help that they need. This is the same idea, but applied for mental health, right? So you're not gonna be in a position to uh, help somebody going through something, right? Like you still need actual doctors to fix challenges and problems. Uh, but, you know, if somebody's, let's say, going through some kind of dramatic episode, uh, this, this is a, you do a day-long course, and they give you a lot of great resources for learning how to recognize what might be going on with somebody, how to help stabilize them in the more moment, and guide them to appropriate resources to get proper treatment. Uh, you Often this is run by your local um, health department, so I live in New York, uh, and the New York City Health Department offers free classes and will do trainings at your company. Um, but you can go on there and they'll have plug in years of code and find out what's up. Uh, so strongly recommend that. Uh, so to kind of wrap, oh, and one last quick note with uh, both, both of these topics, uh, just-in-time delivery is not good enough, right? Uh, at the point where somebody is having a challenge related to any of this, if you're figuring out how that all works then, it's better than not figuring it out ever, but it's too late, right? So I strongly recommend as soon as you're thinking about going down the management road, start learning about this stuff, right? Just like anything, you're never done, but the more you can get ahead of things and be in a place to recognize things early, uh, the better off you will be and the better you can support your people. Okay, so uh, to wrap things up, uh, you know, becoming a manager can be a bit uh, tricky and scary and we'll mess up but we'll also get back up and uh, do better. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna throw out some quick resources. Um, this is a great uh, kind of company, I guess. Um, so I learned about manager tools through their podcast. Uh, they'll just have like 20, 30 minute podcast episodes on like really specific topics of like, you know, becoming a manager of an existing team, uh, dealing with like uh, absenteeism, dealing with uh, or promoting people, evaluating people, um, it's great. On their website, they have something called the Map of the Universe, that's a bit of a screenshot, you can't really see it with the crazy resolution, but um, that lets you kind of navigate all the content they have, so like if you do experience a specific situation where you need some guidance on like what's a good way to handle this, uh, it's a great resource. They also do some in-person trainings, I haven't gone through it yet, but if it's as good as the rest of the content, it, I'm sure it's great. Uh, I mentioned RANS, uh, really great stuff. One caveat with Managing Humans, it's a really good book, but it's a bit 201 kind of level stuff. Uh, so maybe don't try doing everything in the book on your first day. <laughs> um, related thing there, uh, if you follow that link, there's a Slack channel uh, organized by uh, Michael um, of technical leaders. Uh, it is really high volume, so I've actually not kept up with it great lately. Uh, but there's lots of little niches in there that you can, you can find and get good support on, uh, especially if you don't have a good local network to build off of. Uh, and with that, that's what I got. Thank you very much. Cool. So uh, I think we got a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you could come up to the mic, if you got any questions. Uh, I would repeat uh, Brandon's plea for 
questions in the form of a question. <laughs> um, otherwise, all right. Hi. Uh, my name is Dan. I work at a small company in New York. And cool. we're in the process of growing out our team pretty dramatically. We're planning to maybe double in size within the next year. Um, so I guess my question for you is, what are the kind of benchmark levels of team size in terms of when do you need managers? We have exactly one manager who's also a founder of the company right now. Um, and we have an unresolved issue as to how many more people needs how many more managers. Yeah, um, it's a good question. Uh, I guess the two quick answers I have on that is, so the initial trigger for management for me tends to be uh, when you can't keep up with what everybody else in the team is doing, right? Like if you don't know at a detail level what everybody else you're working with is doing, that's usually a sign that maybe management would be helpful of some form. Um, as far as then specifically how many managers you need, um, it obviously can depend on the, how the company works and whatnot. I personally found, especially if you're doing the one-on-ones, uh, having more than five or six direct reports per manager gets really problematic and rough. Um, so hopefully that gives some, well at least that's what I found obviously different people have different ideas there. Hi, great presentation. Oh, um, thank you. So you're a manager now, not an engineer anymore. So I'm wondering, do you find that your technical skill set is starting to um, atrophy, maybe? And if so, how do you guide a technical team, a team of engineers, as um, you're doing less and less technical work over time? Do you feel like that's more challenging, you know, keeping up with technology since you're not doing technical work? Uh, I mean, uh, like anything, it's uh, not strictly binary. Uh, except for, I guess, binary itself. Uh, and so, you know, while I'm not strictly doing coding a lot, I'm still pretty involved in, like, architecture discussions and code review and feedback. Um, and I still do side projects and whatnot. Uh, I'm personally, uh, at least at the point in my career where, where I made the change, uh, I felt like I was in a place where um, the main value I was adding on the technical side was more... Um, seeing how things fit together and kind of looking at kind of more the um, higher level things and try, like, uh, uh, maybe put it in other ways, it's okay for the people that you manage to be smarter or more exper like more knowledgeable about something than you are, <laughs> right? Because you're, you're there to help facilitate them and not to do the work for them, right? So it's okay. Um, as far as things getting rusty, yeah, I mean, if I go pick up Python, maybe I have to take a few minutes and look at a, bit, a few more docs than I would have, you know, four, four or five years ago. Um, but that's okay. Like any skill, it, it can come back with, with practice. <laughs> cool. uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, so I had a quick question about uh, if you've ever had team members who carry different working hours mm -hmm. um, and whether or not setting an expectation for people to be at least in at a certain time was something that you cared about or where you fell on that. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, definitely a thing. I have uh, people on my team who work in New York and work, uh, let's be generous and call it San Francisco hours. <laughs> uh, and other people who work almost London hours. Um, and yeah, no, it, it, a lot of it, so it's, it gets complicated in that it's, there are direct coordination questions, right? And, and like collaboration questions, but there's also questions about uh, kind of larger kind of company cultural questions of like, what, what do you want your workplace to be? So a lot of it you probably can't completely decide by yourself and you need to work with the rest of your organization to figure out the expectation for the company overall. Um, especially because having different teams with different expectations can be problematic. Um, that being said, specifically in the case where you say, okay, I don't care, like I, I really don't like managing by butts and seats, right? Like that's a pretty ridiculous way to manage developers if you ask me. Um, but it, um, the biggest thing I tend to focus on is making sure that people are doing what they need to do to make sure that they are collaborating effectively, right? So I'm okay if people work different hours as long as it doesn't become a situation where it takes 24 hours to turn something around going back and forth between people, right? So whether that means that they, you know, dial into a meeting before they come into the office, whether that means that they make sure that they know what somebody needs before that person leaves, right? It, it's, I've put, put a lot of the focus on making sure that they, they are owning that collaboration and making sure that stays efficient, and then from there, letting things go how it goes. Cool. Do you have any top tips for dealing with other managers, especially non-technical ones? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, a lot of it, so um, I tend to generally come from a perspective, or try to come from a perspective of um, trusting that somebody 
uh, is doing their job and fulfilling their responsibilities until there's substantial evidence otherwise. Um, that may sound slightly obvious in some ways, but it, uh, it goes a long way in, in kind of letting somebody start off on a good foot and not starting off in a bad place can go a long way to just helping establish relationships and have more effective conversations. Beyond that, um, if you are having challenges working with uh, other groups or other managers, it's generally helpful to have specific things to talk about as opposed to just general, like if you go to somebody and say, hey, generally your team's kind of a pain in the ass to work with, like that's not an easy conversation to make productive. But if you can say like, hey, on this day and this day and this day, we put in requests to your team and then it was ignored for three weeks, right? Like that's a some, much more concrete, like getting concrete is helpful. Uh, and then beyond that, depending on the nature of it, uh, maybe trying to find mediation for, through more senior management or, or something like that. Thanks. Yeah? So I'm not a manager yet, but I do have an intern, and I like the managerial aspect of the one intern. Mm -hmm. But how can I know that I'll enjoy managing a whole team of people and from that one kind of experience? Um, <laughs> the, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, the, the best way I would, I would try to think about that is uh, kind of think about the different aspects of your day, and what is it like if you got 10x more of that, right? So. <laughs> Um, and not to say that like the experience actually would be that, but just as the thought exercise, right? So um, if you really enjoy um, you know, having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with your intern, seeing uh, them develop over the course of, of their projects, seeing them doing well, in a, like if that's really rewarding to you, then likely having a larger team would, and growing into a, a manager who does more stuff would be re rewarding. On the other hand, if every time you're going into a one-on-one, -on -one, you're, you're bugging out that you're not coding and like really upset that you're maybe doing only 60% coding instead of you know, 80%, uh, that maybe is a sign that more would not be good. But, cool. Hi, uh, so you spoke a lot about, this is tall. You spoke a lot about um, how to be an approachable manager for everyone underneath you. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know what you think about the skills you need to manage up. And I'll give you an example. Sure. Uh, I've had experience with a manager who's been like super easy to talk to, super great, but mm -hmm. in action, like the difference between a mentor and a manager is the manager can actually do something about your problems, especially if it's within your company. Mm -hmm. If I go to someone and say, hey, there's something wrong, I feel this way. If they were a mentor, I'd like them to listen. If they were a manager, I'd like them to do something about it. So I guess what is that balance? Uh, sorry, to just rephrase, uh, basically, you're asking... Uh, I mean, there's an aspect of managing up, yes. right? So I guess yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Sorry. so I guess a lot of it comes to... Uh, it depends a lot on... Obviously, it depends a lot on the context. The biggest things I tend to look up for is managing expectations, right? Mm -hmm. So making sure that um, uh, that my manager knows, you know, at, at least at the appropriate level of detail, what's going on with my team, what am I concerned about, what am I, what am I not concerned about, um, what do they need to know about, um, and uh, making sure that it's clear to them what you need, right? So if, let's say, you are in a situation where you're having a conflict with another manager and it's impacting your team, they need to know about that, right? And they need to know that you need the support from them to, to, to resolve that, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. Uh, managing expectations and uh, communicating needs. Going back to one of your earlier comments, uh, do you have any suggestions for creating kind of a balanced division of responsibility where you don't have to be the lead technical expert as the manager and you're supporting people who are in the technical expert role? Yeah, so uh, in that scenario, and that's actually something I've, I've been going through recently is uh, due to various uh, things that have happened, uh, I've actually had to be less involved in some of the technical decisions and, and have more people on my team come into more of a technical leadership role even though they're not directly managing. Uh, and the best thing I've, the main things I found there is, you know, identifying who who's interested in that versus who's not because that's a thing. Uh, and then from there, making sure they have the support and guidance they need to kind of run, run, to run with, run the ball, right? So make sure that they, they know that they have your trust and support and that like, you know, like, uh, putting your, injecting yourself and requiring checkpoints for every decision is probably counterproductive. 
<laughs> right? You still have to you still have to keep your hand on the wheel, right? You still have to be involved and in, in, you know check in, make sure they're going not going off course. Um, but at least f for me, you know, making sure that they know that I trust them to make the right decisions and run with it, and that I trust that they'll let me know when they think I need to know something, uh, is probably the biggest thing to develop. Thank you. Cool. Sorry. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you. A lot of what you focused on was uh, moving from full-time engineer to a full-time managerial position. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this advice uh, work when you're in more of a part-time manager, part-time engineer position? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, I the the, the times where I've been 50-50, I, I personally actually just know I per, don't handle that well. Uh, I find that it's really hard to balance the two just because it, it has such conflicting needs as far as uh, like time, attention, um, and like context switching. Uh, that being said, um, I guess a lot of the career path aspects of it maybe are less relevant um, and when you're in that kind of 50-50 state, uh, although, uh, sorry, thinking this through. I mean, I guess it comes down to, at least in my experience, uh, staying 50-50 is just not tenable to do super long. So at some point, it does tend to work out where you kind of have to uh, go one way or the other. Um, beyond that, though, uh, if you ignore the career path stuff, all the other stuff still applies, even if you're uh, part time. Awesome. The Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, if anyone has any more questions or comments to share with Sean, please uh, find him after the talk. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, everybody.